This is Judges chapter 2. Decades before, when Moses was about to die, Yahweh told him, quote, This people will arise and play the harlot with the strange gods of the land into the midst of which they are going, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be consumed, and many evils and troubles will come upon them. Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 7. That time has come. Verse 1. Yahweh's angel came up from Gilgal to Bochim. He said, I brought you out of Egypt and have brought you to the land which I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not listened to my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. When Yahweh's angel spoke these words to all the children of Israel, the people lifted up their voice and wept. They called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to Yahweh. Comment. In verse 1 it says, Yahweh's angel, or the angel of the Lord, went up from Gilgal to Bochim. Gilgal was the name of Israel's first camp after they crossed the Jordan River, and it says the angel of the Lord went up from there, probably meaning uphill out of the plain of the river into the hill country to a place called Bochim, exact location unknown, but obviously somewhere within the land of Israel. The angel of the Lord is a little mysterious. Some would claim he's the incarnate Christ. Others might say he's one of the myriads of angels of the Lord. All we can say for sure is that he's a faithful and true messenger of God. The angel has a message, and the bottom line is that Yahweh gave Israel very clear instructions over and over again to make no covenant with the locals, to completely demolish all their idols and altars to their foreign gods. But Israel has ignored all those instructions. So in verse 2, Yahweh says, Why have you done this? Because obviously it's madness to ignore God. Therefore, Yahweh says, I will not drive out the locals anymore as I've been driving them out. You'll have to live among them. The locals will be in your sides, it says, or thorns in your sides, as it says in Numbers 33, 55. And the God, their gods will be a snare. In other words, they'll be constantly tempted to worship the gods of these new friends they've made in the promised land. So for you and me, friendship is not necessarily a good thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, quote, Don't be deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals, end quote. So let's not attach ourselves closely to the wrong people. It will corrupt our morals. So after this incident, the people named that place where the angel spoke to them, Bokim, which means weepers, the wrong friends, will eventually bring sadness and weeping. Now coming up in verse 6, we're backing up in time to the book of Joshua to what happened right after Joshua gave his farewell speech. Verse 6, Now when Joshua had sent the people away, the children of Israel each went to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of Yahweh that he had worked for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Yahweh, died being 110 years old. They buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim on the north of the mountain of Gaash. After all that generation were gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who didn't know Yahweh nor the work which he had done for Israel. Comment. That was an explanation of why the people ignored God. The generation which saw all the miracles in the desert passed away, and then the generation of those who witnessed the miracles of the conquest passed away. And after that, Yahweh sort of went quiet as far as working miracles, or as it says in verse 7, it was a generation that didn't see, quote, all the great work of Yahweh that he had done for Israel, end quote. That's all it took, just a little lapse in miracles and Israel forgot Yahweh. Here again, this is something Yahweh warned them about over and over. He kept stressing the importance of teaching the children the history of Yahweh's great works, but either the parents didn't teach it or the children ignored it. Exodus 12, 26 and 27, Deuteronomy 4, 10, Deuteronomy 6, 7, and Deuteronomy 11:19 and other places. 
Yahweh even wrote a song and taught it to Moses so that the children would learn. One of the lines says, quote, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you. Deuteronomy 32, 7. So we have a responsibility to teach our children. God won't work convincing miracles in every generation. Now coming up, Israel will go the way Yahweh predicted they would go. Verse 11. The children of Israel did that which was evil in Yahweh's sight and served the Baals. They abandoned Yahweh, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the peoples who were around them, and bowed themselves down to them, and they provoked Yahweh to anger. They abandoned Yahweh and served Baal and the Ashtaroth. Comment. Baal and Ashtaroth are the gods of the locals, and Israel has begun to worship them. This is a problem because Yahweh is jealous. He said so himself, Exodus 20, verse 5. We can understand his jealousy because we're made in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26, which means we have certain things in common with God, such as our emotions. If you and I love someone, and we have an agreement with that someone, and that person is unfaithful, it arouses a jealousy in us that can make a gentle person go absolutely ballistic. And that's the nature of God. Jealousy is an emotion that arises out of his love for us and his attachment to us. He doesn't get out of control like we can, but he has the same intense jealousy. So in his wisdom and strategy, God did the following. Verse 14. Yahweh's anger burned against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, Yahweh's hand was against them for evil as Yahweh had spoken and as Yahweh had sworn to them, and they were very distressed. Comment. Various raiders are coming in and taking all their stuff, whether it be clothing, gold, silver, valuables, food stores, it was certainly anything the raiders could carry. So Israel's being reduced to poverty and hunger. In verse 14, this is the hand of Yahweh against them. Yahweh probably had several reasons and motivations for doing it, but one of the reasons is to discipline Israel and return them to himself, Leviticus 26, 18. That's the ultimate goal and most desirable outcome in the mind of Yahweh. He laid all this out very clearly beforehand before they ever came into the promised land. Now coming up in verses 16 through 19, we have a preview of what's going to happen over and over in the book of Judges. Verse 16, Yahweh raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they didn't listen to the judges, for they prostituted themselves to other gods and bowed themselves down to them. They quickly turned away from the way in which their fathers walked, obeying Yahweh's commandments. They didn't do so. When Yahweh raised up judges for them, then Yahweh was with the judge and saved them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it grieved Yahweh because of their groaning by reason of those who oppressed them and troubled them. But when the judge was dead, they turned back and dealt more corruptly than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. They didn't cease what they were doing or give up their stubborn ways. Comment. In other words, there were repetitive cycles of idol worship, which caused Yahweh to discipline them by raiders, which caused Israel to groan, which caused Yahweh to have pity on them and raise up a deliverer called a judge. The judge would lead them to victory over their raiders, but in spite of being delivered, Israel wouldn't listen to the judges and went back to other gods, which started the cycle all over again. But we can't say it's really a repeat cycle exactly because each generation did worse than the previous one. That's what's coming up in the book of Judges. It's a sad history of a nation who once knew God in the times of Moses and Joshua, but they forgot him and will not learn to be faithful. Verse 20, Yahweh's anger burned against Israel, and he said, Because this nation transgressed my covenant which I commanded their fathers and has not listened to my voice, I also will no longer drive out any of the nations that Joshua left when he died from before them, that by them I may test Israel to see if they will keep Yahweh's way to walk therein as their fathers kept it or not. So Yahweh left those nations without driving them out hastily. He didn't deliver them into Joshua's hand. Comment. The presence of foreigners in the land is a test from God, quote, that I may test Israel, end quote. 
James 1.13 in the New Testament says that God doesn't tempt anyone, but certainly there are situations in this world that test us. Life will prove what we're made of. Will we trust and obey, or will we make it necessary for God to send discipline? We have to make a continual point of remembering God, living like He says to live, and teaching our children. If we're not doing that, we should ask the same question that God asked. Why? Why, why, why? It makes absolutely no sense to do anything else. That's the chapter. Judges 3 is next. Mark it down. Find it easily at landofhavila.net and put judges in the search box.